Hey guys, this is Snap. Today we're going to be talking about how to level and or transition your party to in-game farming. So the question I get a lot is how do you approach the campaign leveling? What builds do you choose? And basically how does it all work together in a party? So I'm going to try and go over as much information as I can here. Now throughout this guide, I'm going to try and refrain from giving you guys specific builds to play because it's super easy for a lot of this information to get outdated if I'm just giving you specific things to play. Obviously there are nerfs and buffs every league, so the stuff people are going to be playing to level up their character to the end game is going to change from league to league. However, there's a lot of nuance in leveling a full six-man party or even your two or three-man party. So while I'm referring to other leveling builds, I'm just going to be referring to you what is the most popular leveling variant of that particular build. So for example, this upcoming league, uh, both of our pushers are going to be playing Seismic Trap. I think it is just the best option. However, in future leagues, when Seismic Trap inevitably gets nerfed more, you will just see other builds crop up and take their place. However, that doesn't mean the leveling style changes at all. You're just simply playing a different skill. And while I can provide you POBs and stuff for how we're going to be leveling all these characters, there are a lot of other people specifically like people that have experience in races that can explain and or give you much more refined POBs than I can. So when you guys are asking, how do I level all these party builds? Generally, I'm going to be referring you to other directions because those people have more expertise in stuff like racing and early game POBs. Now with that out of the way, I'm going to quickly go over what everybody is going to be playing and leveling as. I'm um, just to give you guys some basics on what you might play in your two through six man party. Now from my last party comp video, you can see all the builds here in the party. These are ranked by order of importance. So if you're playing in a two man, you probably want to have a carry and an orb. Obviously, if you have a third person, you run a curse buff. Fourth is mana guardian. Fifth is the color. And sixth is obviously your flex support. We're playing the minor support. Now we have two shadows, one being an assassin eventually and one being a saboteur. Both of these people are going to be going seismic trap and that is a no brainer. These are our two atlas pushers because they're playing a super strong carry build early on. They can both play mines and or traps and push the atlas super far and then later respec if they need to. You basically want your two strongest or maybe three strongest party members to be playing the best build possible so that you can get your atlas progression done super fast and then you do as minimal of a respec as possible and then you can start doing whatever content you'd like whether that's five orb deli simulacrums if you're doing maybe a two man or a three man you can choose the kind of content you'd want to run obviously our third carry in this scenario is the mana guardian he is actually going to be starting a high row and he's going to be playing the super popular explosive air ballistas i think it's probably the best choice for leveling a templar right now so we're just going to be jumping on that train and he's just going ea ballistas so those three builds should be pretty straightforward and there should be tons of material on how to play those particular builds just because those are so prolific. Obviously, I'm not going to give you the best advice on how to optimally level a Seismic Trapper or an EA Ballista character. I would look to other content creators that are maybe super familiar with the builds like Seismic Trap and or EA Ballista. They are obviously going to give you a lot better information than I can. Now, the reason you want two and or three Atlas pushers is simply because of Alva missions. On top of that, you guys can all share map completion. So all of these characters operate independently. They're essentially playing solo for the first maybe day or two of the league, depending on how long the Atlas takes. Basically, you're mapping on your own, and if you have a map that other people need completion for, you just call in everybody else, and they can warp into the completion. You guys kill the boss together, and then you warp out. Boom. Three people or four people get the completion. On top of the sharing completion, as I mentioned before, the Alva missions are super important. One key component of end game MFing is to have permanent Alvas on all of your maps because of how OP it is. Uh, it is currently super difficult to try and sustain 100% Alva, and then obviously if you have two people that are being able to split their missions, it's just going to make it a lot easier to sustain those Alva missions. I think that is especially more prevalent now that the magic watchstone mod that gives you the master missions is probably going to be watered down um, from what it currently is. You're going to maybe have to crutch on maybe two or three completed atlases so you can perma rotate your Alvas. Now, if you're planning on doing stuff like simulacrums and you don't necessarily care about these master missions, you could definitely just get away with having one atlas done. And then sharing completions in this case is kind of unnecessary. So once again, basically the three or two pushers you have in your party just operate in independently. They're playing a completely normal build. It's nothing geared towards the party. You just want to pick a super strong build early on that can basically finish the Atlas, get all of your Atlas passives unlocked, as well as all of your Sextants, which is the Void Stone, and then you can transition to a party build. Now, the other three people in the party, we call this the wheelchair party, can basically have a lot of leeway in what kind of content they're running. I'll get into the specifics of how you level in the campaign a little bit later in this video, um, but essentially you get through the campaign as the three man, and you can run whatever content you want early on that's just generating you guys economy. There's a lot of different strategies you can use early on to generate wealth, whether it's chaos recipe focus, whether it's heist focus, whether it's low tier MFing like cemetery, which is our preferred strategy right now, you can choose the money making method you find the best. And there are completely legitimate strategies that differ from the ones that we do. So you have a core group of people that are pushing the Atlas and a core group of people that are just focused
focused on maybe running low tier heist with a D level strategy. I'll link to Spicy Shushi's guide on that down below if you're curious about that one. Definitely a super viable option, but your main focus is just generating money. And hopefully by the time the Atlas pushers are done completing their Atlas and they have our Atlas ready to do five orb deli, you've generated enough wealth for the party to do a full respec and acquire all the gear that's necessary. Obviously this might look a lot different if you're in a duo or a trio or a four man. Generally if you're in a two or a three man, it's just going to be one party doing the whole Atlas together, which is fine. You're just going to have to rely on map sales carrying most of your economy, which depending on league to league could maybe uh, suffer in your economy a little bit. Uh, but generally map sales are enough to carry uh, the economy for any party that's just pushing into deep Atlas. And in that scenario, the aura bot and the curse bot generally don't need to respec at all. It's just the carry. So I touched a little bit on leveling the aura bot and or the curse bot in a party and what that transition looks like in the first couple acts. But basically our color, who is the pathfinder or ranger, is playing a rain of arrows build super early. And our goal is to just buy a storm cloud ASAP. And then we turn on a bunch of auras at level 32 with generosity. And then we scale all that flat damage with rain of arrows because it has a bunch of extra proj. Then you add some curses into the mix and it's a pretty easy campaign clear. Now, as for leveling the ranger, I am going to link down to Havoc's YouTube channel here. He has a lot of useful guides on leveling bow characters. Um, he is obviously super experienced. Razor has numerous global first titles. So I would definitely look to him to see like kind of what the meta is on leveling bow characters, especially early on in the campaign. He's done a ton of optimization in this area. Definitely just copy whatever he's doing. So if the meta does change for bow characters in the future, you know, you have a resource like Havoc that you can go and just copy their build. Now, leveling the aura bot and the curse bot can be a little bit tricky, uh, but basically the magic level you're looking to get to is level 32. Um, at level 32, the aura bot can go basically a full aura bot build with a four link. And if you set up that four link properly, you can carry the whole campaign. So I'm going to include two people POBs down here in the description. One of them is for the aura bot and one of them is for the curse bot. And in these POBs, I'm going to put five passive trees down here that you can scroll through that should kind of show the progression that you're doing as you're going through and leveling an aura bot in the early first couple acts. Basically, in my opinion, the best skill to be using uh, to level the aura bot and the curse bot is lightning trap. Uh, lightning trap, I think, is the best level 12 skill right now. Um, it's also super low investment for the aura bot. So because it's so strong, you have to invest less points into spell damage and stuff on the tree. And it makes the respec cost maybe like five points once you hit like level 32. So real quick on the Scion, the pathing looks something like this. You basically come out of the spell damage nodes out of Scion, out to Harrier, and then you quickly run over to Master Sapper. I personally take the mastery that gives you 30 life when your trap is triggered. It helps with recovery early on, especially if you get it super early. So you get Master Sapper, you can take a few proj damage nodes down here because Lightning Trap is a projectile. So you can get around 40% ink damage from taking these nodes at the bottom. After that, you can path up towards these aura nodes, which is influence. But before you take those, you probably want to take mysticism since it's a pretty good place to get some base spell damage which is basically what you want early on after that you definitely want to fill in these aura clusters here you want to take this aura cluster you want to take this aura cluster and this aura cluster there's also some life nodes you have access to down here additionally you can take written in blood if you do need more life from here you're looking to unspec all of the trap nodes because at this point you are an aura bot and then you path over to the left here and you're just going to come grab this last aura cluster here which is sovereignty additionally eventually you unspec these proj damage nodes here you want to come out and get some free elemental resistance and then you can go over to the scion life wheel to grab a bunch of life if you need it and that's going to be your basic life based aura bot basically as you're completing the campaign as you're like hitting level 60 70 this is what your character is going to look like you're just path into all the aura nodes you have some life and it should be a pretty easy transition now the first 32 levels of the scion is where you can kind of brick yourself so i'm going to explain clearly what i do to level so you can kind of get an idea of how you get to that level 32 and what things you want to be looking for now a lot of this is just general racing knowledge so this might not come as a surprise to most of you but basically in act one you want to be using the tried and true combo of storm blast mine into orb of storms into frost bomb this is basically used by most builds to clear act one it's a super solid setup super easy to set up so basically as you come to town after you've killed hillock you want to pick up two wands from the vendor and then buy a storm blast mine that should use all three of your wisdoms the storm blast mine should clear the first couple zones just fine and as you hit level four you'll be able to buy orb of storms and frost bomb as well as a frost blink your three link for this will be onslaught linked to orb of storms linked to frost bomb in a three link you can also link the lesser poison you get from the quest reward to the storm blast mine for a little bit of extra damage if you have the sockets but if not you should be just fine you want to pick up all blue and yellow items in act one and vendor them until you have two transmutes you also want to be looking out for a blue blue green item preferably on a wand so you can set up your three link should be pretty straightforward to clear the first act using this very simple setup with storm blast mine and orb of storms from 
Frost Bomb, and the instant you hit Act 2 and or Level 12, you want to set up your Lightning Trap ASAP. The three link for this is Lightning Trap, Multiple Traps, and Added Lightning. This three link will carry you into the 30s and or 40s with no additional investment, but you should definitely be looking to 1. Put on Herald of Thunder at level 16, as well as Skitterbots for 1 alt from the vendor in Act 2. Also, if you manage to get your blue, blue, green on a wand, make sure you do the wand craft. It's a big boost of damage. However, my damage is usually fine in the campaign, so if I find an extra alt and or a blue, blue, green wand, I usually hand it over to my pushers so that they can have a better push if they don't necessarily find their own. Once you have the Herald and the Skitterbots and you have this three link setup, it'll just be a breeze to clear basically anything. Now, you want to start looking out for your four link aura setup. You also want to try and put a Scepter and or a good Ellie Res shield in your offhand at this point so you can swap to a melee weapon that you can smite with once you're level 32. Your four link is going to be red, 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 blue. And those links are Anger, Wrath, Generosity, Smite. That four link is super strong, especially on Reign of Arrows, which can leverage flat attack damage a ton. You're shooting like 20 extra arrows and all of those arrows are getting all of that flat attack damage, it's super strong. So you want to use the best flat damage auras you can here. Obviously, if you're playing like a spellcaster, you can adjust these auras accordingly. Uh, zealotry and or hatred might be the best skill, depending on what your carry is playing. But for us, Reign of Arrows, we're using flat damage in the form of Wrath, Anger, Smite. It's the best option we have. You set up that four link at level 32. It's a super big power spike and it should easily carry you deeper into the axe. Um, the next big upgrade here and something I'm going to be doing on League Start is trying to buy a Trippanon as early as possible. Uh, Trippanon, I believe, is an eye level 40 unique or 40 level requirement. Uh, the reason this is good is it was recently changed in the patch notes here to make it so that this works with the new destructive link that was added in Scourge League. Now, this is super powerful because obviously now you can cap your carry's critical strike chance instantly at around level 40, maybe 45, depending on when you're able to get your hands on one. And that should be a gigantic boost to your damage. Now, obviously, you want to jam in as much other utility as you can, maybe some Volors, Vol Haste, Vol Grace, maybe Vitality Precision and stuff, just for that little bit of extra attack and cast speed. Uh, but that should be the basics on how to level your Aurobot out of the campaign. You're essentially going to be playing this life-based version of the Aurobot until you can get stuff like the Covenant and or the Course getting Elixir to finally make the jump to low life, at which point you can turn on the Purities and or maybe Determination, and then your Aurobot will be rolling everything in the game. Now, the Curse Bot here has a very similar setup. Essentially, you're going to be doing that Orb of Storms Frost Bomb in Act 1, and then also looking to use Lightning Trap from Acts 2 to 4 and or 5, depending on when you transition to a party. Um, basically, you come out of the Witch Spell Damage nodes, you can go through Lightning Walker, you can come up to Crackling Speed. From there, you're just going to be looking to get your extra curse by the time you guys are partying up. So after you do your first lab, you're going to have a max curse limit of 3 because you're 1 from a cultist on the Malediction node, and you have plus 1 from the Whispers of Doom. At which point, you can turn on Blasphemy plus 3 curses. You should have enough reservation for that on your mana bar. Our curse bot usually turns on Ellie Weakness, Conductivity because we're doing lightning damage, and your last one can be a defensive curse, typically in Feeble. If you don't feel like you need the defenses, you can obviously just apply a mark in the form of Ass Mark and or Sniper's Mark for big single target boost. Just like the Scion tree, I have some progression here at the bottom you can flip through, um, but after you take the plus one curse, you just path over to some curse nodes here as well as some aura stuff because you can maybe reserve an extra 50% aura if you get some efficiency, and then eventually you're just specking all these life nodes, and then you go to a big boy curse bot as soon as you get the Doedre's chest, at which point you can start transitioning to the endgame build that I've linked in my previous Arch Nemesis guide where you start grabbing large cluster jewels. Follows a similar path to the Scion Aura support in that you're operating independently until you're around level 35, maybe after you've done the first lab, because after the first lab, you can basically apply an additional curse. You have three curses, very, very good in the campaign. One last thing to talk about here in regards to leveling party builds is going to be zone allocation and which person is going to be running which zone. So in our scenario, we have three people that are pushing the zones and or pushing Atlas. Now, Acts 1, 2, and 3 can get pretty complicated in terms of zone splitting. But essentially, when you guys are practicing, or if you're not practicing at all, you want to try and delegate people to do the zones before you guys have even started your campaign run. So make sure you know which person is doing which zone. So for example, we have one person dedicated to killing the Dweller of the Deep in the Flood Depths. We also have one person dedicated to getting the trial after we get to the prison. We have one person that's dedicated to killing Brutus. As we go into Act 2, it becomes a lot more complicated. Obviously, there's a lot of objectives to grab here, and essentially, we all split six different ways. We have our Aurobot sent over to the Crypt. We have one carry going over to Weavers. We have one carry going over to Kraitlin, and one carry going to the Chamber of Sins. Hopefully, we all hit the objectives at the same time. We all put down our own portal, and then we all group together to do the objectives at the same time. Your setup is probably going to look a little bit different from us, but conceptually, the idea is that you all split up and do your own objective, and if you get there a little bit early, you can 
can put down your portal and continue to farm monsters. And as soon as all of your other party members have completed their objective, you call everybody else in and you go for one sweep and complete everything all at once. Now, obviously, this is a little min-max. You can take a more straightforward approach and just group with three, four, five, or whatever and just go do all the stuff together. Act 3 is pretty similar. We split our carries up into going into these zones. At this point, we have the wheelchair party, which is the Scion, the Curse Bot, and the Reign of Arrows carry. They're essentially just farming the best XP zone until they are called in for objective. So essentially, when we get to Act 3, we have the wheelchair party. They're all farming separately in the city of Sarn. And whenever we get to the objective in the crematorium, one of our carries will call us in and we will all warp in. The best farming zones for each act are as follows. You start with City of Sarn and then go to Docks once you have it unlocked. You can do Aqueduct once or twice, but you want to jump ship in Act 4 to go to either Duresso's Dream or Combs Dream. I've seen some split opinions on whether or not which zone is better. Uh, they seem to be about even to me. In Act 5, you obviously want to be going to the Chamber of Innocence. Now, you are going to be here for a while, so when you hit about level 38 when you're minus 5 on this zone, you go straight to Chamber of Innocence, and you're sitting here until about level 50. Once again, you're just sitting here farming while your other three party members are actually pushing the campaign as normal, making sure to port you into every objective. And then once you've gone past a certain level threshold, all you have to do is simply change zones to the better XP area. Generally, the next zone you can go to for a little bit is the Northern Forest. Uh, it is quite good. However, depending on the league, like in Delirium, we just sat in Chamber of Innocence because it was so good. The next zone after that is going to be Toxic Conduit. Um, it is very good. It has a lot of blue mobs. There is some sticky tar degen that makes it super annoying, but it is the best zone for XP. Um, after Toxic Conduits, you're going to be jumping ship over to Blood Aqueducts, obviously. Now, you can sit here for as long as you want. You can farm as many tabulas as you want, and then you can break into your low-level strategies, such as Heist or Low-Tier Cemetery, or you can push Atlas if you're in a smaller group. One last trick to go over here is going to be the concept of boss tagging. Essentially, when you're playing in a party of two or greater, when you're playing specifically in the campaign, you can tag bosses to be one player HP. Once again, this only works in the campaign. This does not work in maps or even in Labyrinth. But essentially, if you activate a boss and you get its health bar to show up and somebody else ports in, that boss is then activated and snapshotted with one player HP. This is super useful for all of the act bosses as you can snapshot it with the player HP of one and then six people can come in and do the DPS of six people essentially making the boss fight six times easier. All you have to do is activate it with one person and then have everybody else warp in after the boss is activated. Keep in mind for bosses that phase, such as Mervile, the health multiplier of the boss is updated between phases. So you'll commonly see us leave in between phases to ensure that the boss's HP stays snapshotted at one player. This is also super useful in Act 2 for the bandits. The way you snapshot bandits is to simply talk to them. When you have the interface up at the top that says kill and or help, the boss's HP is already activated and snapshotted. Then if everybody else teleports in while you still have this kill or help interface open, everybody else can then click the kill button and the bandit will only have the HP of one player. And so this will obviously speed up your campaign progression a lot. But yeah, this should help you uh, guide you a little bit in the right direction in terms of what to play in a party um, and kind of how you should be approaching leveling in a group. Now, as I keep stating that these builds will change, specifically this stuff we are using to push Endgame Atlas. Next League, we probably won't be playing Seismic Trap, it'll be nerfed. Next League, we probably won't be playing Explosive Arrow, it'll be changed, but the structure of it all will not change. There are a few considerations, however, with the new Atlas tree, that you might want to have more or less pushers getting a fully completed Atlas with full Void Stones, depending on the types of bonuses you get. So if there's a crazy amount of Alva generation, for instance, on the Atlas tree that we don't know about, it's going to be less pertinent for you to get as many people to have their atlas tree fully complete because if you can just put it on one person then that's just going to be easiest cleanest and best however breaking it up between a few people definitely lessens the burden so it's just a few things to keep in mind but i think that about sums it up here we're also waiting for the atlas passive tree so we can get a little bit more information on how we want to do our planning if you have any questions i'm always happy to answer them in the comments try to answer as many people as i can i also stream on twitch every league start we also might do a practice run or two here starting the next couple days so be sure to tune in for that. And once again, I'm Snap, and thanks for watching.